الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين. السلام عليكم dear viewers and welcome to the Church of Media Corporation's program, The Virtues of Islam. In previous um, programs, we have been discussing the various virtues of Islam, and we have been talking about the obligation to enter Islam perfectly. That the Quran and the Sunnah give instruction of how to enter it. And during those episodes we've been discussing, uh, the meaning of Islam, one which is general, that covers all the Prophet's uh, call to the people, and the one which is specific, which is the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, calling the people to these be the belief and also to the, the laws of the religion of Islam. We have come to a verse in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, when هذا صراط مستقيم فاتبعوه ولا تتبعوا السبب فتفرق بكم عن سبيله Translated to mean, and verily this is my straight path, so follow it. And don't follow other paths, for they will separate you from his path. And this is used as an evidence to show that a person should enter into Islam properly, should enter perfectly into the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The straight path is known as the Salatul Mustaqim, which is spoken of in Surah Al Fatiha, as well as in this verse, which is verse 153 of Surah Al An'am. And it has a number of definitions. Salatul Mustaqim has been defined as the Quran itself, the Sunnah itself. Al-Islam itself. And the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, has been defined as the Siratul Mustaqim. All these definitions are interrelated. Because any person who holds on to Islam is holding on to the Sunnah. And whoever holds on to the Sunnah is in fact holding on to the Quran. Furthermore, whoever is truly holding on to the Quran is holding on to Islam and the Sunnah. Therefore, it's an obligation to adhere to Islam as decreed in the Quran and in the Sunnah in accordance with the manner that was, that was prescribed by the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He clarified this. And Allah Subhanahu Wa says, وَلَا تَتَّبِعُ subul," And do not follow other paths. This portion of the verse clarifies that following other paths, such as religious innovations and vain desires, instead of the Suratul Mustaqim, the straight path, is forbidden. Because the verse clearly says, subul, and do not follow other paths. This verse illustrates that it's mandatory to enter Islam and forbidden to leave it for something else. An Umm Mu'mineen, Umm Abdullah, Aisha radiallahu anha, called it. The mother of the faithful said, Qala Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Man ahdatha bi amlina hadha ma laysa minhu, huwa rad. Wa fi riwaya, مَنْ عَمِنَ عَمِنَ لَيْسَ عَلَيْهِ أَمْرُنَا هُوَ الرَّدْ So here we're discussing the aspect of entering into something which resembles the true path but is not the true path because it does not have evidence from the book and from the sunnah that it should be practiced. It resembles it but it is not because it has no sanction. No permission from Allah to carry it out in the way it's being carried out. Or no sanction or permission from the Messenger of Allah sallallahu to carry it out. And this is known as a bid'ah, an innovation. On the authority of the mother of the faithful, Aisha, may Allah be pleased with her, who said, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu said, he who innovates something 
in this matter of hours. This matter of hours means Islam. That is not of it will have it rejected, meaning by Allah. In another version it reads, he who does an act which we have not commanded will have it rejected, meaning rejected by Allah. Both versions of the hadith are authentic. Their individual wordings provide evidence as part of a great foundation involved in keeping the religion pure from innovation and innovative practices. And when we say innovation, it means something practiced as religion, but did not come from the religion. It is practiced as religion, but did not come from it. And the problem with this is, if someone does something and practices something that's supposed to, is supposed to be from the religion and is not from the religion, then in fact the person has not come into Islam perfectly. He has altered it in a way which is forbidden to do so. Both versions of the, of the hadith are authentic and they give evidence to the necessity of refuting innovation and innovative practices. The first narration, he who innovates in this matter of ours, meaning Islam, that which is not from it. The, one, the wording here is he who innovates. This means the individual who started the innovation. Even if he did not practice it himself, he was the originator of it. Therefore, whoever starts an innovation, it is rejected, and he will be among those who are losers in the hereafter. Because the slam is complete and been completed by Allah. The second narration, he who does an act which we have not commanded. This involves a person who does the innovative practice, even if he wasn't the one who started it but he does it following the one who did start it. And again, what is the problem here? The problem here is that, uh, that a bidah, an innovation, something done in the religion to get near to Allah, which has not been sanctioned by him and not sanctioned by his messenger, negates entering Islam completely. It is, it is something of a mix of something from the outside, but it's not Islam. So therefore, it cannot be called entering Islam kafatan. Bid'ah and religious affairs are of two categories. One, an innovation, a bid'ah, which is unbelief. Two, one which is not unbelief. Both these categories can be found in beliefs as well as deeds. In other words, there are some beliefs, if you do them, they are an innovation which takes someone away from the religion. And the other ones are some that don't take people from the religion. They are found both in the beliefs of people and they are found in their deeds. An example of bid'ah in belief, an innovation in what people believe, is which comprises unbelief, is negating from the Lord of the worlds, Azawajal, all descriptions. Saying Allah cannot be described with anything. And believing that he has never had any descriptions. This belief is an innovation. Historically, not even the people of pre-Islamic ignorance believe such a thing. They always believe that Allah, Azawajal, had descriptions and qualities. An example of bid'ah in action, for instance, is seeking intercession from the dead. Seeking intercession from the dead is major shirk. It is major shirk, meaning it takes one from the fold of Islam. A person goes to the cemetery and asks the dead to intercede between him and Allah. That is major shirk. And it's these kind of things that people must stay away from. They must keep away from them altogether. And there's no such thing as a good bid'ah, 
bid hasana only in language. If, that, if those terms are used, it means language. As the famous statement has been said about Umar al Khattab, when he placed the people together uh, when praying uh, Taraweeh, he said, This is my bid'ah. Meaning, he said, This is a bid'ah. Meaning, this is something which hadn't been done in a long time, and now he's bringing it back. Because we knew that wasn't a bid'ah because the Messenger of Allah had done it before. He did it for one or two nights in Ramadan in his life. So therefore it could not be called a bid'ah which is evil. As far as bid'ah which is not kufr, not unbelief, it can be found in the beliefs of the likes of Irja and the Khawarij. These are two groups that came after the time of the Messenger of Allah. Innovations that are not kufr are also found in acts of worship. They make up the majority of religious innovations, those done in acts of worship. This category includes innovations in innovative acts in the salah, in the dhikr, and innovations in celebrations, and so on. These acts do not constitute unbelief. However, they are innovations whose level of severity depends upon the situation. Innovations in the way in which the religion is practiced is of two types. And here again, it's being mentioned because an innovation pro prohibits a person from entering all the way into Islam. This blocks a person from entering perfectly into Islam because in fact it is not Islam. Innovation in the way in which the religion is practiced is of two types. One, an absolute innovation. This type of innovation has absolutely no basis in the Sharia. Some things that come into the religion, they have no foundation in the Sharia. You won't find them anywhere. Two, a relative innovation. This is when a person seeks nearness to Allah by way of an action whose foundation is sound. The foundation of the act is in fact sound. It is in fact found in the religion. However, he adds something to it which takes it away from the way it came in the Sharia. This is done by altering the original act in one of a number of ways. One, altering the number of the act. Two, the form of the original act. Three, the species or type of the act. For instance, if someone wanted to sacrifice a, um, a, a wolf during the biha, where we do Eid, and he decides he wants to sacrifice a wolf instead of sacrificing one of the animals that is legal. It is a species. D, the cause of a particular act of worship. E, the place where an act of worship takes place if someone wants to make Umrah and Hajj to other than Mecca. And the last but not least, the time of a particular act of worship. These alterations are illustrated in the Athar of al darami on the authority of Amr ibn Salami who said, we were sitting at the door of Abdullah ibn Mas'ud before Fajr prayer, so that if he came out, we could walk with him to the masjid. Then Abu Musa and Ashari came to us and said, has Abu Musa and Ashari came to us and he said, has Abu Abdul Rahman come out yet? We said, no. So he sat with us until he came out. And when he came out, we all stood up. Abu Musa said to him, oh, Abu Abdul Rahman, just now I saw something in the masjid that I have never seen before. But I do not think it was anything but good. He saw it. He never saw it before but he didn't think it was bad. But I do not think it was anything but good. He said, what was it? He said, if you live, you will see it. He said, in the masjid, I saw some people sitting in circles waiting for the prayer. In every circle, there was a man. And in their hands, they had pebbles. He would say, say Allahu Akbar, meaning Allah is most great, 100 times. And they would say, Allahu Akbar, 100 times. He would say, 
say la ilaha illallah, there is no God but Allah, 100 times. And they would say la ilaha illallah, 100 times. He would say, say subhanallah, 100 times. And they would say subhanallah, 100 times. He said, what did you say to them? He said, I did not say anything to them. I was waiting to see what you think. And I waited for your command. He said, why did you not tell them to count their bad deeds? and guaranteed to them that their good deeds would not be wasted. Then he moved on, and we moved on with him until we came to one of the circles. So one of the companions saw this. He'd never seen it before. And then he mentioned it to a more senior companion. What do you think? So then they went and moved to one of the circles. What is it that I see you doing? Abu Musa Ashari asked him. They said, oh, oh, Abu Abdurrahman, these are stones with which we count the takbirs, Allahu Akbar. And we count the tasbih, subhanAllah. And we count la ilaha illallah a hundred times. He said, count your bad deeds, for I guarantee to you that none of your good deeds will be lost. Woe to you, O Ummah of Muhammad how quickly you have become doomed. His companions are still alive, and his cloak has not yet worn out. This is close to the Prophet's death, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And his vessel has not yet broken. But the one in whose hand my soul is, you are either following a way that is more guided than the way of Muhammad, or you are opening the door of misguidance. They said, by Allah, O Abu Abdurrahman, we intended nothing but good. He said, how many of those who intended good did not achieve it? The Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told us that some people would recite the Quran, yet it would not go any further than their collarbone. And so this long hadith is an example of, in the, in the origin of the act, dhikr Allah, it's legislated. It's a good thing. It gets us near to Allah. But we must do it the way we were, the way we were instructed, and only in that way for it to be uh, rewarded by Allah. I'm Talib Abdullah for the Sharjah Media Corporation. Dear viewers, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.